remain standing for the reading of Scripture. Job chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, page 420 in your Bibles there and the chairs. Job 6, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my vexation were weighed, and all my calamity laid in the balances. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. For the arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are raised against me. Does the wild donkey bray when he has grass, or the ox low over his fodder? Can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the juice of the mallow? My appetite refuses to touch them. They are as food that is loathsome to me. Oh, that I might have my request, and that God would fulfill my hope, that it would please God to crush me. He would let loose his hand and cut me off. This would be my comfort. I would even exult in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should wait, and what is my end that I should be patient? Is my strength the strength of stones, or is my flesh bronze? Have I any help in me when resource is driven from me? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures uh, forever. Let us pray. Lord, we bless your name as we have been assembled in your presence and have sought to render to you that service that you have revealed to us. And we come now to the time of the preaching of your word. We ask your spirit would open your word to us in a powerful manner through its preaching. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Sometimes in the administration of discipline or even justice, there occurs what we call extenuating circumstances. Now, boys and girls, that is a big word, extenuating circumstances. But I imagine most of you have experienced extenuating circumstances. Imagine Sam runs to mommy and says, Mommy, Monty, Johnny hit me. So mommy goes to deal with Johnny and to discipline him. But when she talks to Johnny, Johnny says, Well, Mom, Sam hit me first. Oh. Now that changes that. It doesn't mean that Johnny is right, but those are extenuating circumstances, and Johnny will not be as disciplined in the same way that he would have been if he had simply started a fight. Brother, judges do that. They will consider a case and the, the circumstances around the crime, and they might lessen the penalty because of that. You know, Solomon said that there's a difference between the man who steals bread because he's hungry and the man who steals bread because he's greedy. There are extenuating circumstances often in life and in the meeting out of discipline or judgment. And really, that's what Job is focusing on now in the passage of Scripture uh, that we have just read. Uh, Eliphaz has finished his first response to Job. You remember that after they sat with Job for three days, uh, Job vented his grief and anger in a very improper manner, cursing the day of his birth, even wishing to die for completely wrong reasons. And Eliphaz interprets that speech as the speech of a man who does not have integrity, who is a hypocrite, that's what's happening to Job is happening because Job is a sinner. And so Job begins to respond to Job 
with the assumption that Job is only getting that which he deserves and his words prove that he is, in fact, a gross hypocrite and sinner. Now, in chapter 5, Eliphaz uh, lays out principles with respect to the character of God. And he's right on target with respect to what he says about God. In chapter 6, though, or, or chapter 4, chapter 5, then, uh, as we saw two weeks ago, uh, Eliphaz begins to apply that to Job's situation. Basically, you're reaping what you sow. You need to repent and wait on God, and He'll restore you to your former glory. Eliphaz's first speech ends in the end of chapter 5. And we have now Job's second speech, his response to Eliphaz and his friends. Now, some writers uh, say that actually, in all the dialogue, <laughs> that they're actually talking past each other. They're like uh, old ships passing in the dark. But I think upon careful examination, it's quite obvious that uh, Job, in particular, is answering his friends. And that's really what he's doing now in uh, the chapter before us this morning uh, and tonight. They've accused him of hypocrisy because of what they assume about his life and because of the very wild speech that he made. And Job feels compelled to defend his integrity and to maintain a good conscience in the midst of their accusations. And that's what he's doing here. And for us, there is the principle then that uh, within our trials, we have a responsibility to defend our integrity and to maintain good consciences before God. Now, some people will say that what I'm doing is moralizing. But let me remind you that this is wisdom literature. And if it's wisdom literature, that means that we're going to be looking at these narratives to learn godly wisdom. Yes, the big picture that we've talked about is here. The great battle between God and Satan through Job. And Job is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would never deal with the passage and, and leave Christ out of it. But as I was thinking about the, the narrative and, and the dialogue... In a sense, we learn truths here in the same way that you might be watching a film or reading a work of fiction. And that the, through that process of, of observing the actions of others, your emotions are moved, and you can learn very important principles. So that's how I'm looking at uh, chapter uh, 6 this morning, that uh, how we uh, ought to follow Job's example and the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, by Christ's power. And in our afflictions, we should indeed defend our integrity, and we should maintain a good conscience. So these are the two things that we will look at. The defense of integrity, verses 1 through 7, and the maintenance of a good conscience, 8 through 13. Job immediately begins to address the issue about his speech. That's where they have attacked him. And he answers in verse uh, 2, Oh, that my grief were actually weighed and laid in the balances together with my calamity. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the seas. Therefore, my words have been rash. Job says, by all means, I've spoken over the top. You could also translate this word rash. I've spoken wildly. I've spoken without restraint. I've been rash in what I have said. But he said, cut me some slack. Consider what I'm undergoing. If you were to weigh my calamity and my trials, it would be heavier than a wagon load full of sand. Now, if you've ever uh, compared sand with topsoil, it is exceedingly more heavy. Now, that makes sense because sand is ground up stone. And so sand is weighty. Or if you put on the balances, the grief, what he was feeling over against what was happening to him, um, it, is, it is horrendous. So Job says, cut me some slack. Yes, I have spoken rashly. He admits it. He has not glossed over that part of his behavior. He owns the fact that he has spoken wrongly about life uh, and about what he wished God had done and would do. 
Now he goes on uh, to intensify the grief that he is experiencing in verse 4 uh, with language that is uh, startling. The arrows of the Almighty. Remember, Almighty is the name by which they most often spoke of God. The arrows of the Almighty are within me. Their poison my spirit drinks. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. He begins to open up now the internal part of his suffering. We've alluded to this. Job's experience was far beyond anything that he could begin to imagine. God had been his friend. God indeed had put a fence around him. God not only walked with Job and blessed Job, but God had manifested his gracious presence to Job. Now suddenly, God goes over against him, not as a friend, but as an adversary. And thus the language of the arrows of God with poison tips have pierced him. And the terrors of God, the blackness of separation from God. And some of you have known that. You've known the, the blackness, the, the dereliction of going through a time in your life when you really thought God had deserted you. And you were in the depths of despair. And Job is simply explaining why he spoke the way that he did. He really wanted them to, to understand this. And in doing so, he's also for us a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, here's this first glimpse we have. Because through Job, we can learn something of the emotional life of the Savior. What he says, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, verse 38. My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Soul pain to the point of death. That's what Job is saying. He's helping us understand exactly how the perfectly righteous Savior felt as he faces now the reality of not just the physical aspect of the crucifixion, but the reality of this dereliction. And the arrows of the Almighty will pierce his heart with poison tips. And he's going to fall into a deep blackness illustrated in the supernatural eclipse that took place, but a blackness of his own soul when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, what Job experienced was but a little bit of God's withdrawal. Christ experienced it completely. But let me warn you this morning that if you're not a Christian, what Job has explained here is exactly going to be your experience. Perhaps in this life, but most certainly in the one to come. Continuing in Psalm 7, which we just sang, now the psalmist uh, uh, says in verse 12, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. This is what God is warning you this morning if you're not a Christian. His bow is already bent. The arrow is in the string ready to be loosed on you. His sword ready to come down on you. And if he spares you in this life and you die outside of Christ, he will not spare you in eternity. And so the, what Job expresses here, in fact, is going to be the reality of every single one who is outside the Lord Jesus Christ. Job goes on to prove his case uh, of why he spoke the way he did. Uh, with two analogies, again, from creation. In verse 6, does the wild donkey bray over his grass, or does the ox low over his fire? He says, if a donkey is hungry, he uh, will not bray. If an ox is full, he will not low. But the lowing, the bray, is a sign of hunger. Now, what he's saying is, if a mute beast manifests physical pain uh, by cries, how much more 
um, a man with a soul and the image of God. That's really all he's saying. Perhaps you've been on the farm and you heard the cows coming in at the end of the day, lowing, hungry or desiring to be milked. That's what an animal does. And Job says, that is why I have spoken as I have. Then he changes the figure. In verse 6, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste? And the ESV says, uh, is there any taste in the juice of mallow, a uh, medicinal flower that is tasteless and slimy? Or because the word in the Hebrew means slime, the ESV of the New American Standard says, in the white, uh, slimy the white of an egg is, in the white of an egg. The idea, regardless of the particular article, is there are tasteless things and they must be salted to be palatable. So Job says, just as our senses physically react to that which is tasteless, it's natural that our senses then react to that which is harmful to us spiritually. And so he says, my soul refuses to touch them they are loathsome food to me. So he says, my soul draws back from the calamities. Typically, does my soul draw back from uh, the anger of God and the separation of God and the arrows of God that have pierced me? Now, you see what he's doing here is, yes, in a sense, he's making an excuse. But he's making an excuse to say, you guys have judged me wrongly. Yes, I have spoken rashly. Shouldn't have said it the way I did. But you're judging me on the basis of my speech that I'm a hypocrite. And Job's conscience is crying out for vindication. Job is speaking here to um, free himself from their calumnies and accusations. And he shows us it's an important thing to do. Whitfield had the policy that he would never vindicate himself against the uh, accusations and slanders of his enemies. That's a, a very noble attitude. But the problem with the attitude is that often, particularly for a public person, the accusations and calumnies are going to discredit not just the person, but the ministry, and thus the gospel and the honor of God. And so there must be a, a, a moderate defense when you are attacked in the midst of your trials, particularly attacked that well, you must be suffering because you've done something wrong, or there's slander and gossip that circulates around you, then you do have a responsibility to defend your integrity. Yes, Christ was silent before his judges. But you know why Christ was silent before his judges? Well, it was, of course, prophesied in Isaiah 53 that he would be. But why? Because if he had spoken, he would have been exonerated. They could not have resisted. They already knew he was innocent. Pilate declares at least three times that he was delivered up because of envy. There's no guilt in this man. The text quite clear. They couldn't even get false witnesses to agree. And that when he confessed that he was the Messiah uh, in a way that was consistent with Scripture, they needed to examine the Scriptures. No, he was silent. But think about the Apostle Paul, for example, in, in the book of Galatians or in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is very interesting, isn't it? Because Paul goes to great length, and often with some sarcasm and irony as well, to defend his apostleship. Why? Because his ministry was tied to the gospel. And he had to defend himself in order to defend the gospel. And that is going to happen to you. And there will be times, particularly under persecution or trial, that you'll need to defend your integrity. Now, on the one hand, you need to remember the warning of Peter as well. And when you do suffer, let it be because of righteousness' sake, so you can defend your integrity. And do not suffer as an ill doer. This is also an answer that we need to push back against the health, wealth, and prosperity people with. Because they maintain to this day that um, if God is favors upon you, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. So if you're suffering, it means you're a sinner. You don't have faith. It's very important for us for the integrity of the gospel to push back 
against those accusations. On the other hand, even though Job here rightly defends his integrity, he would have been better off if he'd heeded the counsel of the Psalms and muzzled his mouth in the presence of others at the beginning. And so let's don't create problems for ourselves by speaking unwisely in the presence of others. And so Job defended his integrity, admitted that he had sinned with his mouth, but said, you guys are wrongly judging me. My wild words are not signs of a wild heart. The second thing he does then, uh, the result of what he's doing, is he maintains uh, a pure conscience. Now he does so, he teaches us the importance of doing so, by reiterating his desire to die. So we see in verses 8 and 9. Oh, that my request might come to pass, and that God would grant my longing. Would that God were willing to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Now, some take this request very similar to what Job had said earlier about wishing to die. I don't. I don't think this is an invalid prayer on the part of Job. I'll try to show you why. He reiterates, but now in a different manner. Before he was, he, was, he was ranting, and he had a completely wrong view of death. He only saw death as a physical solution. But you see now, he is he's moderate, he's submissive, he's humble. Oh, an expression of prayer that my request might come to you, and that God would grant my longing, and that he were willing to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Job's language here reflects that of the curse of the fall in Genesis 3, 19. By the sweat of your face you'll eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken for your dust, and to dust you shall return. You'll be crushed. We all will be crushed and return to the dust of the earth unless Christ comes before the end of our days. Job was fully convinced that he was near death. This is not a, a healthy man that's merely depressed. Or a man who's having a great difficulties. Um, this is a man that thought his next breath would be his last one. Remember, he is in excruciating pain. Now I want to ask you, is it wrong for a person in that situation to pray for death? The person whose pain is so terrible that they are arriving, their end is approaching, is it wrong to ask God, take me now? Or the person whose only soul is, is morphine, but with morphine, he loses consciousness of, of all the surrounding, of family and loved ones, and can, can have no final conversations with them. Is it wrong? Is it wrong when you see uh, your loved one lying there in the Alzheimer place, completely oblivious to everything, knowing that they would long to be with the Lord? Is it wrong to ask God to take a life in those circumstances with humility and submission, not taking things into one's own hands, simply casting oneself on a merciful God, knowing that that God will do what is right. So I want to defend Job. I think there are occasions when it is proper for a believer to pray that God will finish what appears to be the end. Now, there's three reasons for this approach that Job gives. Uh, in verse 10, he gives his first, and this is his conscience. It is still my consolation. I rejoice in unsparing pain. I mean, the pain is unsparing. But what's his consolation? I have not denied the words of the Holy One. He gets to the root of the issue. That which uh, Satan was all about. Curse God and die. The words put into the mouth of Job's wife. He understood quite well. He had he'd known the temptation. 
uh, to rebel against God in the midst of, of uh, the loss and the unsparing pain. And you can rest in comfort that he had not done that. He had not denied the words of the Holy Spirit. But also think he's not hidden them. He's not held back uh, a confession of the true God. That's very interesting. Take a concordance and look up the Holy One. Now, this is the first uh, time chronologically this is used in the Bible. The revelation of God as the Holy One does not happen until Moses wrote. And Job lived a good while uh, before Moses wrote. And so we also learn that it's in the midst of our trials and difficulties that we do get new insights into God. And Job now perhaps interacting with the revelation that Eliphaz had about God being just and righteous and that one could not justify oneself, Job now names God the Holy One, and it's a glorious name. Many writers say that the holiness of God is, is the, uh, the gravity, the center of all of God's attributes. It's His transcendence, that He is removed from everything else that is not God. This is purity. It's removed from everything that is impure and sinful. He indeed is the Holy One. Holy in character. Holy in word. Holy in works. It's a beautiful name for God. And thus the words that Job had received from God. He had not denied those words. He had not hidden those words. He will proclaim God to this generation as he had uh, earlier. Of course, to think of God as the Holy One reminds us then of the necessity of uh, justification through the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you and I can be accepted with the Holy One is that through the work of Christ, He forgives our sins. He constitutes us legally righteous in His sight. But when He's done that, and you know He's the Holy One, then you understand that it's through regeneration and sanctification that He is doing a work in you to conform you to His image. It becomes both the pattern and the motivation. You... You past few months read through Leviticus. And in Leviticus, be holy because I'm holy. And that's what God says to every one of you this morning who names his name. He's the holy one. And therefore, if you're in Christ, you must pursue that holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Do you sit here this morning with a passion for holiness? A passion for in outward actions, but in thoughts and affections to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Job had this clear conscience. He could die. He could die comfortably because he knew that he had not grossly sinned against God. Here we see that relationship now of integrity and conscience. A second argument, it's implied, it is not as obvious but some writers take this when he says in verse 11, what is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should be patient? You see, here he implies in waiting for the end that there's something beyond death. In his first speech, death was an end in itself. He wasn't thinking about death as the gateway into eternity. But here he begins to express what he'll fully confess in chapter 19. Job believed and understood an eternal life. And so he says, that's what's waiting for me. Basically, Lord, bring it about. And that's what will motivate us. It's also what motivated Paul in a very different state. He, he wasn't in, in danger, uh, in pain, but uh, he knew he could be put to death for the gospel's sake. And he said that was actually better. It's, and he uses a very bad grammar. It's so much all the more better. <laughs> to die and be with Christ. But it's God's will to stay and pursue the gospel, then that's what I do. And he was convinced that was God's will at that point in his life. So, in all of your pain and sorrow, deep, dark depression and struggles, keep your eye on eternity. Keep your eye on the fact that uh, there's something much better that's waiting for you in Christ Jesus. Job had his eye, I think, on an end that was different from what he had said earlier. 
And then the last argument, and this is uh, uh, a cry of, of grave weakness in 11 and 12. What is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should endure? Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh bronze? And I prefer here the uh, ESV in verse 13. Have I any help in me when resource is driven from me? Now they've been hammering Job. You're a sinner. You're a hypocrite. You need to repent. And Job said, I would repent. If I knew of what, I should repent. But my conscience bears witness to me that I'm not in the need of repentance. Uh, and you're telling me that hang in there, Job, and everything's going to get good. And Job says, I'm teeter-tottering on the precipice of blasphemy. Yes, in his conscience, he knew that he had not sinned, but he wondered how long could he live faithfully under the bombardment of the pain and the blackness of the separation of God. So that's why he makes this comparison. Is my strength the strength of stones or my flesh bronze? How long am I going to last? He's basically saying, Lord, take me before I deny you. Now, you could say, well, he should have understood no temptation is taking you, but such as common to man and God with temptation bring away to escape which may be prepared. He lived a few thousand years before that promise was given to God. Part of the beauty of the unfolding of Revelation. And so, yes, he should have had a better grasp of God's grace and sustenance. But again, in the blackness of his uh, suffering, sorrow, and fear, he really was afraid. You know, sometimes God mercifully takes a person's life to deliver them from a sin or a sinful environment. In Isaiah chapter 57, verses 1 and 2, the righteous man perishes and no man takes it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands for the unrighteous man is taken away from evil. Did you get that? The righteous man is taken away from evil. That's exactly what the prophet says to Jeroboam's wife when she comes to him disguised in 1 Kings chapter 14 to see if her son is going to die. And the prophet Ahijah says yes, but it's very interesting in verse 13 of 1 Kings 14, all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave. In other words, in a peaceful way, even in the jump. Because in him, something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house. Now, who put that good in this? Oh, God. But here was a young lad, righteous, godly, converted man. Going to be raised in the mixed midst of pagan, Baal worship, false religion. You see, it was an act of mercy. God to take it. In my early days in Chula, Mississippi, uh, there was a man converted out of the grossest of sins. I think genuinely converted. In a very short period of time after his conversion, he had, I think it was uh, a brain hemorrhage. And he died. Left a widow and little children. And this was the passage that came to my mind. And he died. Because he was, all of his friends were bootleggers and gamblers and wicked men. That was his family. That was his friend. That's the only environment that he knew. And I thought about uh, Jeroboam's young son. God sometimes takes the righteous away in that to take them out of evil. So Job was praying that God would do that for him. Yes, he should have trusted God's grace. But in this, I, what I'm trying to show you is that he humbly prayed that God would take his life. He wasn't going to take his own life. And he was humble. He, he's praying here, your will, not mine, be done. But you understand you have to have a good conscience to pray that, don't you? You perhaps have, as I have seen, uh, unconverted people die. It's not pleasant. 
remember one person, she boasted, I'm not afraid of death, I have kidney failure. Probably lived three days longer than medically she should have. I watched her at the end, with every ounce of her being fighting against the inevitable. And the wicked, the unconverted face the reality of death and the judgment that is beyond. But you and I have also witnessed the death of the righteous. And the peace and the testimony. Or you've read the testimonies and biography. You see, necessary for that is the good conscience. Maintain a good conscience. Job, even though he's spoken rashly, Job had a good conscience. And you must maintain that good conscience. Now, that's not a sinless conscience, you understand. A good conscience is the conscience that keep short accounts with God and men. Good conscience is when it's convicted of sin, it immediately asks God for forgiveness and any against whom or before whom the sin has been committed. So a good conscience person is the one who strives to live by the holy law of God and confesses his sin readily for Christ's sake. And he sins. And that was Paul's great claim, wasn't it? Time and again, I've maintained a good conscience. I hope tonight you can say, this morning, that you have maintained a good conscience. And so, we see from Job's speech that he's doing necessity for the believer in the midst of trial to defend integrity and maintain a good conscience. But that can only happen in Christ Jesus. He is the one who suffered far beyond what Job suffered. He too could say, is my strength the strength of stones or my flesh bonds? Is it that my help is not within me and the deliverance is driven far from me? He put the cup to his lips. He didn't pray for death, but nor did he turn away from it. He gladly, voluntarily took the cup and all of his weakness and let the arrows of God pierce him their poison tips, endure the blackness of God's wrath in order to deliver us from our sin. And give us the grace necessary then so that, yes, we have grace for whatever the circumstance is that God brings us into because we are resting in Christ Jesus alone. I trust that's where your rest is. Father, we thank you for this speech and what we can learn from the experience of Job and how we can see Christ through him. And may your spirit indeed strengthen us in our own pilgrimage uh, with uh, these things. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen.